And how great is our God oh, Sing with me How great is our God And all will see how great How great is our God you for each and every person in this place today. Help us this day and every day to learn to wait on you and to find joy in your presence. God, this morning, open our hearts to hear the word that you'll speak through President Lindsay and help us to have a good second day of classes. In Jesus' name, amen. Please greet those around you. I'm excited to welcome you to the first chapel of the new year. Let's give a special welcome to our new students. And can we welcome our returning students? Finally, a very special welcome to our faculty and staff. Students, many of you have already attended your first class of the semester and experienced the culture of faith and learning integration we seek to embody. At Taylor, our academic mission is inextricably linked with our Christian commitments as we de desire to draw closer to God through our studies and bring Him glory. The pursuit of knowledge is not simply an intellectual exercise, but a whole person journey of growth and discernment. With this in mind, we have the opportunity to celebrate a special and significant moment together as we install one of our esteemed faculty into an endowed chair position. These positions are steeped in tradition and ceremony and represent the highest accolade a university can bestow upon a professor. The concept of endowed chairs goes back to ancient Rome 
and the most established universities have endowed chairs in a range of disciplines. We are pleased to have a few here at Taylor as well. To award an endowed chair is not a casual matter, but a recognition of the highest order. I now invite Taylor's chair of the Board of Trustees, Mr. Chris Gegelein, to share some remarks about the significance of this particular endowed chair. Thank you, Dr. Maxwell. Endowed chairs are critical to our academic reputation and are often named in recognition of the donor. Today, we are installing the Arthur L. Hodson Endowed Chair of Business. Arthur, or Art Hodson, was born and lived most of his life here in Upland. He was a Christian, a business person, and a civic-minded leader who was well known in the community. Mr. Hodson attended Taylor University for two years, beginning in 1930, and later served on our Board of Trustees. Students, you may unknowingly engage with Mr. Hodson's legacy every day when you eat at the Hodson Dining Commons, named in his honor. Mr. Hodson's deep respect for Taylor University is best expressed in his own words at the Dining Commons dedication in 1978. Hodson said, I found my Christian faith at Taylor and I have always been grateful to the people of the university for the wonderful way they try to teach young people to become whole persons. Though Mr. Hodson's words were from nearly 50 years ago, our commitment to whole person education remains true today. When he established this endowed chair, Mr. Hodson stated that the recipient should be a person of outstanding merit, ability, and scholarship in business administration. And we honor such a person today. He desired this endowed chair to strengthen the business department and, and enhance the university's academic reputation. With this in mind, I now invite President Lindsay to pr present a resolution on behalf of the Board of Trustees. Thank you. Well, uh, good morning. It's a very special day. In fact, I would call this a double portion day in the life of Taylor. Not only do we have the opportunity to uh, install Dr. Jody Hershey to the Hodson Endowed Chair in Business, but we also get to celebrate an announcement that we made yesterday. As you may be aware, uh, business and the related fields represent our largest academic programs on campus. So we have been praying for a number of years that we might have the financial support to establish an independent school of business and leadership. And through the wonderful generosity of our good friends, Ken and Virginia Cornwall, that prayer was answered earlier this summer. And yesterday we announced the formation of the Cornwall School of Business and Leadership. We are so blessed to be able to have uh, Mr. and Mrs. Cornwall here with us today. And I thought it would be appropriate for them to just receive a very warm Taylor University welcome. Would you please join me in thanking Ken and Virginia Cornwall. The Cornwalls have been amazing entrepreneurs. Ken ho holds over 50 patents and has built a very successful business. But perhaps one of the greatest reasons why we wanted to name the School of Business and Leadership after them is that they have been faithful over the long call. They have embodied the redemptive love, grace, and truth of Jesus Christ and ministered to a world in need through their 70 years of marriage and through their 
many decades of service. We love you, Ken and Virginia. It's my pleasure to now be involved in the installation of Dr. Jody Hershey, a resolution from the university's Board of Trustees. Whereas the Arthur L. Hodson Endowed Chair of Business was formally established to recognize excellence in business leadership and scholarship. Whereas as recommended by Provost Maxwell and by me, Taylor University now wishes to appoint Dr. Jody Hershey, Dean of the Cornwall School of Business and Leadership and Executive Director of Graduate Programs and Leadership as the incumbent holder of this endowed chair. Whereas Dr. Hershey graduated from DePaul University with a bachelor's degree in communication arts and sciences, received a master of arts degree in corporate and multicultural uh, communication from DePaul University and received her PhD in organizational leadership from Regent University. Whereas Dr. Hershey was recruited to the Taylor faculty in 2004 and has later been promoted from assistant to associate to full professor and served as chair of the business program from 2015 to 2023, and as of yesterday, was established as the founding dean of the Cornwall School of Business and Leadership, and received the Joseph Burnworth Teaching Excellence Award in 2008, and the Teaching Excellence in Campus Leadership Award in 2020. Whereas Dr. Hershey's demonstrated dedication to excellence in scholarship through multiple refereed publications, presentations, workshops, and supervising student research throughout her career. And whereas Dr. Hershey's received multiple research grants from, from Taylor, including awards from the Beatty Center for Teaching and Learning Excellence, the Calling and Career Office, and the Educational Technology Center. And whereas Dr. Hershey has demonstrated commitment to business leadership through professional service opportunities, a variety of regional presentations, and a plethora of professional growth opportunities. Whereas members of the Board of Trustees concur with the selection of Dr. Hershey as the incumbent holder of this prestigious endowed chair. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Trustees of Taylor University approves and empowers President Lindsay to appoint Mary Jo Jody Hershey, PhD, as the holder of the Arthur L. Hodson Endowed Chair of Business at Taylor University with all the rights and privileges thereunto appertaining, and by virtue of her position will recognize this endowed appointment for Dr. Hershey as the Hodson Dean of Business at Taylor University. Please join me in congratulating Dr. Jody Hershey. Thank you, Taylor University. And a special thank you to the Board of Trustees, President Lindsay, Provost Maxwell, and especially the Hodson family for making this opportunity possible. I'm honored to serve as the Hodson Dean for the Cornwall School of Business and Leadership. And in grateful beyond measure for Art Hodson's belief and investment in Christian higher education through the establishment of this endowed position. The marketplace is our mission field, and our goal is to train the next generation of excellent Christian business professionals to enter the marketplace and go out and make disciples as accountants and innovators and marketers and investors and more. So the establishment of the Hodson Dean for the Cornwall School of Business and Leadership will enable us to increasingly do just that. To God be the glory. Thank you. As we prepare to pray for Dr. Hershey, we would invite all of our faculty that are here to please stand. And those of us that are not standing, please extend your hand towards Jody at this time. Dr. Hershey needs our prayers. Amen? Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, in the only name of the one who has done everything for us. And we ask now, God, that you would bless Dr. Jody Hershey, as she takes on this role in this endowed chair role, Lord, that you would give her both your blessing and your courage, God, that she will be a strong leader, one with integrity, one with character, one with vision, that she will continue what she has always done. And in this special opportunity, Lord, as the Hudson Endowed Chair of the Cornwall School of Business, that there will be an opportunity, Lord, for us to shine for you more and more. We pray these things in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated.
The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I see, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. All the days of my life. All the days of my life. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me. He shall hide me. He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, Seek my face, my heart said to you, Your face, Lord, I will seek. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path. I would have lost heart unless I believed. I would have lost heart unless I had believed. Unless I had believed. That I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. That I would see the goodness of the Lord. That I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. In the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. Be of good courage. And he shall strengthen your heart. And he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say. Wait, I say. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Hello, I'm Greg Dyson. Are you feeling stressed? It's only the fall semester, and yet what we need to learn how to do is what our theme is all about. Our theme in chapel for this semester is waiting on the Lord. Psalm 27 talks about this concept of waiting and encourages us not only to wait, but to do it with good courage. Rather than being in a hurry, rather than rushing, we're gonna sit back, kick back, and wait on the Lord. Why don't you join us Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays as we do just that. We're going to wait on the Lord. Thank you. Please stand for the reading of scripture. The scripture reading for today comes from Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God my Savior. Though my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. I will remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Good morning to you. It is my privilege to introduce today's chapel speaker. Dr. D. Michael Lindsay is the 18th president of Taylor University. 
President Lindsay has been married to his college sweetheart, Rebecca, for over 25 years, and today they are proud parents to three wonderful daughters, Elizabeth, Caroline, and Emily. With three high school age daughters, President Lindsay often remarks that there's so much drama in his house these days, he will title his next book, Tears at Breakfast. <laughs> but in all seriousness, if you know President Lindsay, you know that he absolutely adores his wife and daughters, and you'll often see them on walks around campus or cheering on the Trojans at sporting events. President Lindsay brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to Taylor. Before arriving in Upland, he served as the president of Gordon College for a decade. He holds his Master of Divinity from Princeton Theological Seminary and a PhD in Sociology from Princeton University. He has been recognized globally for his insights and research and leadership. And two years ago, during my senior year here at Taylor, I had the terrifying privilege of taking a class with President Lindsay. Word to the wise, if any of you ever have President Lindsay as a professor, make sure to raise your hand and voluntarily participate, otherwise he will make you participate whether or not you want to. But seriously, as I've made the transition from being a student to now working in President Lindsay's office this year, it's very clear to me that President Lindsay truly embodies what it looks like to be Christ-centered and student-focused. And I'm very grateful to know him as a role model, mentor, professor, and now my boss. So please join me in giving a warm TU welcome to President Michael Lindsay. Well, it's a great privilege to have all of you back here and excited to have um, a new year for what the Lord has in store for us. Every time I hear Psalm 27, I'm reminded that when I was in college, I would do virtually anything to woo Rebecca. We were approaching our two-year anniversary for dating, and I decided I wanted to do something special. So I called her mom and said, what is Rebecca's favorite passage of scripture? And her mom said, oh, it's Psalm 27. So I went about the effort of memorizing the 14 verses of Psalm 27. A couple weeks later, we had the special dinner to celebrate our dating anniversary. At the end, I proceeded to quote to her Psalm 27. When I finished, Rebecca gave me a very interesting look. And she said, well, that was nice. There were many things I was expecting when I had done all of this hard work, but nice was not one of them. I said, honey, um, isn't that your favorite passage of scripture? And she said, not really. I said, I, I called your mom and she said, Psalm 27 was your favorite passage. And she said, oh, she said, well, my family, we, you know, we sort of uh, perform musical um, things together. And there's a musical setting for Psalm 27. And my grandmother really likes it. And it's her favorite passage of scripture. I said, I memorized your grandmother's favorite passage of scripture. She said, I think you did. Word to the wise, gentlemen. Always pay attention not only to the girl you're dating, but also her grandmother's favorite passage of scripture. As Greg announced, our theme for the fall chapel service is wait on the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait on the Lord. If I'm being very honest, waiting is not something I like to do. As my family can attest, I tend to like driving in the fast lane on the interstate. I don't like walking behind slow people at the mall or the airport. And as I was walking with Dean, Karen, Elsie coming to chapel, I even like walking fast to chapel. It's just who I am. Since my earliest of memories, I have not been one who wants to wait. And that's probably true for all of us, at least compared to our forebears. We live in a day and age where we want instantaneous response from the apps on our phone. There's a recent study that showed that 96% of Americans will willingly burn their mouth by drinking an unbelievably hot drink or eating something very hot if they get tired of waiting. We will do all kinds of things because we're tired of waiting. It is for these reasons that in 2024, taking seriously the admonition of Psalm 27 is very much counter-cultural. Scholars attribute Psalm 27 to David, believe it was written during a time when he was in exile, either when he was being pursued by Saul or possibly when he was fleeing his rebellious son, Absalom. The Psalm begins and ends with declarations of both comfort and of trust. In verse one, it says, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? 
in verse 3 continues, though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. And then in verse 13, David writes, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. We take heart because although we may be depraved or fall short, born into sin, ours is a God who is good, who wants our very best. Psalm 27 is a mix of both lament and of confidence, of trust and of concern. I love it because it's real, it's honest, it's like real life. We can have absolute security even when we find ourselves in struggle. David can write he has confidence in the Lord even when he is literally fleeing for his life. This psalm has four different movements, the first appearing in verses one to three, where David expresses great confidence in God. The dominant image here is one of light. Light's a very interesting thing because fear of darkness is actually a pervasive fear around the world. Parents, whether they are in the US or China, whether whether they are in Boston or Berlin, they know that their kids are oftentimes afraid of the dark. Caroline and Emily, our twins, were always comforted if we would turn the bathroom light on and just leave a little sliver of the door so that that little piercing ray of light could break through the darkest of darkness. God is our light and our salvation, so we don't need to be afraid. Things that might make us anxious or worried can be put in their proper context in the light of the Lord. This is why a cancer diagnosis for a Christ follower does not have the same grip on that Christ follower's heart or mind as somebody who doesn't know the Lord. It's how tensions with a loved one or conflict with a friend can, with the light of the Lord, be transformed into moments of transformation for us and for others. The light of the Lord relativizes our problems and puts them in the proper perspective because we know that redemption and reconciliation is always on the other side. That is the goodness of God. As David makes clear, nothing is beyond the light of the Lord. As he says in verse three, though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then will I be confident. So today, as we begin a new academic year, I don't know exactly what is on your heart or your mind, but I'm here to remind you that we serve a good God who is our light and our salvation. Even then, we can place our trust in him. The second movement of the psalm occurs in verses four to six, where he talks about wanting to dwell in the house of the Lord. The Hebrew in verse four, where David asks of the Lord, is the same bird that Haman uses in the book of Esther, where he pleads for his life. In other words, this is not just simple supplication. This is a cry from the heart. This is an earnest pleading. So as we look at this psalm, we have to ask ourselves, what is our heart's cry? Do I long to dwell in the house of the Lord? Too often, I think we treat going to the house of the Lord as like going to a restaurant. It's something we do when we need something from God. We may go, but our heart is not really in it. But that's not David's posture. That's not what he's calling you and me toward. Instead, he wants us to gaze upon the Lord to seek him in his temple. The tone of David's prayer is, is different from how most of us approach the house of the Lord. Too often we are cavalier, we're comfortable, we're flippant, but we are to seek the Lord in his temple, to seek his face. So I wanna encourage you as you come to chapel this year, as you go to church on Sunday, let's approach it with the right reverence and fear to seek the Lord with our heart's desire. The faithful back in the Old Testament were given practical advice that's proven actually to be scientifically helpful to you and to me. I've shared previously that up until about a decade ago, I never really dealt with anxiety. It was not something that I really felt, but something happened and then like a thief in the night, it came into my life and it has stayed with me ever since. It took me a few years, but eventually I found ways to navigate anxiety in my life. And in the process, it began to have less of a grip over my heart and my mind. 
One day I was talking to a leadership coach about this, trying to figure out how I could keep my heart from racing when I would get an email from somebody that would make me anxious or how I might redirect the thoughts that would run through my head as I was trying to fall asleep at night, but instead was staying up late, worrying. He pointed me to a book by a Christian philosopher, by Biola, J.P. Moreland, called Finding Quiet. It's not so much a book of philosophy, it's more of a pastoral work. He tells his own journey of dealing with anxiety as he was battling cancer. Eventually, Professor Moreland found that the spiritual discipline that we've called throughout church history as contemplative prayer was helpful. Now, to be honest, I didn't know much about this kind of prayer. It was not something I practiced. But the basic idea is that you get yourself to a place where you can be still and quiet. So silence and solitude is a key part of contemplative prayer. And then you reflect on a passage of scripture like Psalm 27. And you let the words of the passage resonate in your heart. You let it echo in your mind. You savor over each little word or phrase, kind of like uh, what's been called slow eating. It's this idea of just letting it to slow down and to take root in your heart. In the process of that, it's a discipline where you're actually opening yourself up to hearing the still small voice of the Lord. As I was talking to this leadership coach, he said, let's try an experiment. He hooked up this little monitor to me that would measure my heart rate and my breathing. And he used that to take a baseline snapshot of what was going on. We talked about some of the things were causing me anxiety and fear just in regular conversation. And then, keeping the device attached to me, he invited me to close my eyes and to practice some slow breathing for a minute or so. He then guided me to meditate on a particular passage of scripture, doling out a phrase or a clause at a time. He instructed me to listen deeply to the words that I was hearing and to try to find ways to attune my heart to what the word was saying. Even if I didn't feel exactly as the writer was describing, the coach said, why don't you try to imagine what it would be to be in a place where you could say that from your heart? He then asked me to reflect on what this passage had to say to me about God, about myself, and about my relationship with God. We went through this process for about 10 minutes, and then he closed in a word of prayer and took the device off me. He then showed me the graph that showed the difference in my breathing and my heart rate. It was amazing. When I focused on my worries or concerns, all the biometric measures went up and you began to see things begin to cascade as I thought about one problem after another. I don't know if this is true for you, but when I get into an anxious posture in my life, things can sort of devolve very quickly. But then he showed me the graph that when I turned my attention away from myself and focused on the passage of scripture, when I found the quiet through contemplative prayer, the problems began to recede in my mind. They didn't go away, but through contemplative prayer, they found their proper perspective in my life. I, fit, I since have used contemplative prayer at different points in time to try and help me. Sometimes it's by praying or reading scripture, or sometimes it's by listening deeply to um, praise music. Oftentimes, I will listen to the same song over and over and over again. It's a way in which I'm trying to sort of train my mind to actually really listen and with my heart to attune to what God might be saying. In the process, we can get to the same place that David does in Psalm 27. In verse 7, he makes the third movement where he prays for deliverance. Hear my voice when I call, Lord, he writes. Be merciful to me and answer me. Sometimes I wonder, why do we even need to pray, oh God, be merciful? I mean, isn't that his just nature? God's going to be merciful. So shouldn't he just be doing what he's supposed to be doing? Why do we need to ask God to do that? Well, I think that part of the reason it's there is to help us be attentive to who God is. God's going to do what he's going to do. But as we declare it in our prayers, we unleash the power of heaven to also begin to attune our hearts to what God is going to do to make us more aware of God's nature so that we can see it when it concretely happens in our world. As we pray, we realize that 
what an unbeliever might see as chance or circumstance, we see as a divine answer to prayer in our lives. So declaring aspects of God's nature in prayer help us attune to who God is and to have our eyes opened to see where he is at work. In verse 9, David says, don't hide your face from me. Don't reject me or forsake me, God my Savior. These parallel clauses are some kind of signposts in the psalm. They remind us that we need to turn to the Lord. As verse 11 makes clear, we see the Lord as he teaches us and when he leads us on the straight path. Hewing to the path of God requires us to make good choices. So one word of encouragement and admonition, Taylor, is let's make good choices this year. We have to say no to certain, th certain things so that we can truly experience the blessings that God has in store for us. It requires, if we're going to be in God's presence, it requires a posture of holiness, of righteousness, which means that we have to intentionally pray like it says in Psalm 51, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test my thoughts. Point out anything in me that makes you oh so sad, God, and lead me on the path of everlasting life. That should be our prayer every single day as we seek to get right with God before we begin our day. We can meander throughout life, and frankly, Taylor students, you can meander throughout your university years, occasionally getting stuck in the common quicksands of envy or slander or lust. But I'm here to tell you it does not have to be that way. I am living proof that the Lord can deliver you from even the things that have been besetting sins in your life. As David prays, we can ask the Lord to put us on the straight path. So maybe that third movement is what you need to be reminded of and to pray today. There is no sin in your life that is beyond the redemptive work of God, but we have to walk the straight path if we are to find the place where God dwells. So, friends, I encourage us to get on that straight and narrow path, which leads us to the fourth movement, starting in verse 13. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart, and wait for the Lord. A few months ago, the Lord answered a prayer that I quite literally had been praying for 40 years of my life. It was a prayer that the Lord would develop a spiritual hunger in the life of somebody that I loved very much. And almost out of the blue, this loved one called and we had a conversation. And I learned that they had visited a church and they were intrigued by this church pastor seemed to be a nice person the congregation seemed to be warm and friendly and so the person said you know what I'm going to go visit that church my heart leapt to be reminded that at the very moment while I was working on this sermon I have been waiting on the Lord for decades and yet the Lord is faithful to answer prayers that we pray even for a very long time so if there is a prayer you've been praying for a while Taylor do not give up God is still in the business of answering those prayers as we remain faithful. I don't know if it's a relationship in your life that needs healing or restoration or a wrong that needs to be righted. Maybe it's a hurt that is still a little too tender in your own life. My guess is that each of us has something in our lives for which we have been waiting on the Lord for a very long time. And it's Understandable, if you wait for a long time, you might lose heart or patience and your confidence might wane. That's certainly been true for me and was true for David. That's why verse 14 is so important. The Hebrew verbs used here for be strong and take heart, they're not passive admonitions. Rather, they are firm imperatives. They're the exact same language that the book of Joshua uses when the Israelites were crossing the Jordan into the promised land. We need to remind ourselves in moments of waiting, we have good reason to believe that God will meet us where we need it. God has been doing it in the past, is doing it today, and will be doing it again tomorrow. Waiting's hard work, and waiting is countercultural. But Psalm 27 is a great reminder of the goodness of God, our need to meditate and reflect on the Lord as we wait for Him. I've always found the Serenity Prayer, written by the 20th century theologian Reinhold Niebuhr, to be a, a good reminder. It says quite simply, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. 
Serenity is the opposite of anxiety. But it's only given to us when we open ourselves up to the leading of the Holy Spirit. The acceptance that's mentioned here is not the same as resignation or despair. It's about trust, about an intentional submission to the Lord. Many rehab programs from Alcoholics Anonymous to Grief Share recovery groups have cited the serenity prayer as one that has been really helpful to folks as they are beginning a pathway of reconciliation, restoration. It's a prayer for courage that we might undertake the hard work of changing the things that we need to change to be better aligned with the purposes of God. And a prayer of wisdom to understand that we can't change everything, so we need to know the difference. So perhaps you might Google that prayer and pray it yourself this year. The distance in Psalm 27 from verse 1 to verse 14, it's a long one. It moves from one of confident declaration of whom shall I fear to an admonition to wait on the Lord. It's an honest journey through the tough parts of life. It's one of the things I love about the Psalms. David does not gloss over things that are inconvenient or don't always fit the narrative. Life is messy. We take the good with the bad. We have high points and low points. Burdens and blessings on the very same day. But even though we have oppressors and foes, we have to be fearful and we have to run at times, we should not be afraid because we have a God who is good, who is looking out for us. We are promised to be carried into the land of the living. Friends, we may have to wait for the Lord, but the goodness of the Lord will meet us in the waiting for it is as sure as as the coming days dawn. Let's pray. Lord, as we begin a new academic year, we pray that you will guide and direct us. We pray, Lord, that you will give us the endurance and the patience to wait for you. Help us not, Lord, to hurry past, but instead to dwell in your presence. May we gaze on your face we pray even as we worship through one more song that we would encounter your spirit and Lord, that throughout chapel and our involvement in local church that you will speak to us in powerful and profound ways. May we enter into your presence knowing that you are the king of the universe and Lord of our lives and we yield to your leadership, your leadership this day. This we pray in Christ's name, amen.